Welcome to Korean Ruins, the only podcast that can help you to understand how a degree in archaeology and anthropology can help you to become the Deputy Prime Minister or even be appointed a top-level role in Facebook. How about that, mate? Wow. Yeah. So archaeology and anthropology only takes you to the top. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. And and if our podcast is anything to go by, we, we can understand why. Because everyone that we introduce and talk to and learn about are just absolute legends. They are legends. They, they achieve legendary status, as you can see on Twitter. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, I wouldn't mind if all archaeologists got a mania. We've got Maxim Derek, Clegg mania. Yeah. Yeah. What would... Um, Larry Lovable Lawrence now. <laughs> <laughs> Larry Lunacy. Well, Larry Lunacy. Larry Lunacy. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. How have you been? I'm good, thank you, mate. How's your week been? Oh, not too bad. Just a, a normal working week this week. The, I think the highlight has probably been getting some of the pictures you've been sending me of interesting LIDAR data. I know nice. we talked we'll, a bit about they it. They keep coming. They keep coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's the gift that keeps giving. <laughs> but other than playing with LIDAR data, I've been out and about. I've been out near Ross and Wye. Do you know you've been out in that area before? Who? what where why oh get out sort of the welsh border it's a lovely beautiful area near simmons yeah if you've ever been out that way but um sort of exploring forests and had a day out looking at Irish hill fort seeing um a nice medieval sort of castle that had been later transformed into a uh, farmhouse and medieval sand extraction quarry pit that was linked to glass production and a beautiful charcoal burning platform so uh, so that was a lovely treat very nice i must admit i used your adventures in a lecture the other day oh, yeah. uh, without your permission as is, as is true. <laughs> um i was i you know when you you realize that if any of my students are listening, please stop listening now. But you know when you realise you're a bit ahead of time and you've got to kill a bit of time and you start going down a, a, an endless anecdote, a, a Grandpa Simpson style <laughs> anecdote. I, uh, I started telling the story of how you were out for a walk the other day with the dogs and you stumbled across some lime kilns. Oh yeah, that was a good day. Which was lovely because I was sitting there doing all the death-based assessment stuff while you were out and about in the landscape. It was ace. <laughs> it was, I called you up for a chat and we ended up doing a proper archaeological <laughs> assessment of a, a lime kiln just in the field behind my my house that was it was epic a victorian lime kiln not that you'd know it from the hr but uh, we, we got there in the end Better update that i assume you you contacted them yeah oh yeah yeah <laughs> that use of victorian is quite good i'll segue into what's caught my mind this week Ooh, it's almost like we planned it <laughs> it's a subject that's close to your heart sfoliae mm. Sfoliae? 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 Sfoliae, that one, yeah. Sfoliations. Yeah, it's easy, easy for me to, to, to apply and say. Uh, yeah, yeah. What have you been learning about sfolia this week, Lawrence? Well, do you want to tell us what sfolia is, Derek? Um, they... I'm no classicist and I'm no Greek and or Latin person, but it's um, bits of old building stone or statues that get reused in other buildings. Looted, reused stone. Let's go for that. Looted, reused stone. So does it have to be Greek? Or ancient? No, no, no. But I, I'm trying to remember where the, the origin of the word sfolia. It sounds Greek. Mm. I think it's okay, Greek. yeah. Well, <laughs> anyway, in the, the last year for us, we've sort of bumped in some great um, sfoliation. Is that the right word? <laughs> Why not? Is that the right application? We're, we're going to get so many pedants tweeting in. <laughs> Good, after bring this. it on. <laughs> um, but yeah, we saw, we were out in Greece, we saw some in Palamas and we got our secret we project, did. which will hopefully highlight a bit more of that in the uh, coming weeks and months. Mm. But we were also in Athens and we saw that beautiful oh, uh, Byzantine that... church, which is yeah. full of Roman, sort of everything. It was incredible. I think that's one of my favourite buildings because it's full of um, the rims of parts. It's got tiles it's got bits of glass in there it's amazing it's beautiful honestly top, one of the most top sfolia yeah yeah so yeah it's not so yeah and then an office in time team one of our time team visits in broughton we were looking at a uh, what was it it was a barn in a field that yeah it had reused material from a roman building in there or at least some some fence posts and things like that yeah i'd, I'd wager a lot of that was roman but we'll, mm. we'll find out one day when we go back mm. if we go back <laughs> but I, you sort of hit the nail. I'd always assumed and linked this sort of process to old, ancient things. But I had an absolute treat the other day in a home base. <laughs> 
Go on. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, when you when you think home base, you might think 1997 breeze block buildings, and you'd be right. But <laughs> whilst I was pootling around looking for some sand to uh, add to my concrete mix, I uh, I spotted a beautiful stone door that went into the staff room that just stood out carved stone door that stood out like it shouldn't have been there and uh, above the door next to the uh, security camera that was filming me taking photos was a little plaque that said this door dates back to 1846 uh, and is thought to date the old school that was located located in this spot prior to being demolished. And so home base, in their great wisdom, whilst building this monstrosity <laughs> of a modern structure of, of um, breeze blocks and things like that, had whipped out this beautiful carved stone door that, that would have been used and seen hundreds if not thousands of school children go through it oh. and, and repurposed it into their, uh, their their building. And I loved it. I'll be completely honest. I had my doubts at the start of that story, <laughs> um, but, it, but it did improve rapidly. <laughs> That's really interesting. And actually, you've given me the perfect segue into linking to our guest today. It's tenuous, but that's my favourite kind of segue, because what you're talking about there really is, is the, the marrying up, the joining up of DIY shops and archaeology. And one yeah. of the other places I've seen an incredible link of DIY and archaeology is the Tops Tiles sponsored storeroom at Fishbourne Roman Palace, which <laughs> always makes me so happy because there's so many tiles in there. And crucially, it gets me on to our guest today, who is Rob Simmons, the curator of Fishbourne Roman Palace, someone I've had the pleasure of working with for years and years and years now. Um, a background in zoo archaeology, a golden retriever lover, a hypercourse guardian and a Twitter virtuoso, all rolled into one fairly hairy human being. <laughs> <laughs> hairy in parts. <laughs> Rob, thank you so much for joining us today. Absolute pleasure. I've got to, I've got to say, just at the, at the ri risk of uh, betraying my almost fanatical uh, uh, obsession with um, home bases around the country, was that Blanford Forum? That was Blanford Forum. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> We can share home base stories after the podcast, I think, Rob. <laughs> Maybe we could have our old, own side podcast, home based Sfoli, 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 Sorry, Derek, I'm terrible with that word. That's right. You might be right as far as I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, Rob, thank you for joining us and thank you for getting Lawrence's reference to home base. That's a real win for him. That's amazing. He's going to bank that now. As I say, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. We've been working together on and off now probably since about 2014. We did the. Uh, I forget the name of the project now. Was it Building Roman Britain? It was. There's a wonderful YouTube video of us, isn't there, in the storerooms at Fishbourne? <laughs> yeah, let's not talk about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible to finally get you on the podcast and hear about your career, because while I know, obviously, I know you as the curator of Fishbourne, I know you very well from following the Fishbourne Roman Palace uh, Twitter account and the, the many, many um, hours of discussion you have with my dear colleague, um, George Trigues, Dig Miles Russell. I think you may be mistaking me for the Twitter fairy. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, I, I forget. I forget. Absolutely. I, I mean, I've never met that person, but um, I, I, I understand there. There's a horrible Father Christmas comparable moment here. <laughs> <laughs> Don't break the fourth wall. <laughs> so we'll gloss over Twitter anyway. But, but the moral of this this long rambling introduction is: I finally get to learn all about you. And I know, I know, you do have some adventures sometimes in various experimental archaeology places. And as I, as I said in the intro, there's a background in Zuark. But I'd love to know how. You get to being the curator of Britain's foremost Roman villas, palace, palace site. Palace. Palace. Palace, please. Palace, palace site. <laughs> so, <laughs> Rob, tell us, tell us, how, how do you become you? I'm not sure where I start, actually, Derek. Where, 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 where do we start in these things? I mean, do I start when I was six? Yeah. Yes. Where, where it all started. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, 40 years ago. Uh, yeah, and it was my marvellous great uncle Pete. Uh, when I was six years old, he had a little you know, Tic Tacs, you know, those little sweets. Do you still get them? A little Tic Tac box full of carbonized grain. And he showed it to me. And I remember it very, very clearly. And he told me that they were 5,000 years old. And literally, age six, I had no conception that anything could be as old as 5,000 years. It was mind blown. And it was that day I decided absolutely archaeology. I've got to be, because he was an amateur archaeologist, he somehow 
got these things out of a dig that he probably shouldn't have got them out of a dig from. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but he, was, he was an amazing guy. And uh, because I've got absolutely no imagination, uh, I just stuck with it and decided that day, archaeology. Obviously, I was doing it alphabetically and I'm too thick to be an architect. And it's the next one. And um, that's what I did. So went to school, started digging, age 15, at the great, uh, what was it, Charles Street uh, dig in Dorchester for Wessex Archaeology. Back in the days when 15-year-olds were allowed to dig for no money with commercial units. <laughs> Lots of fun. Yeah, they don't do them like that anymore. Um, then what happened to university? I remember that. Um, UCL, undergraduate in archaeology. You see what I mean? Absolutely no imagination. I could have been a vet, you know. <laughs> <laughs> what I really like is that you had that bolt of inspiration and you just stuck to it. I mean, it's we've had many stories and many tales on the podcast of people kind of meandering through archaeology but i like i like the six years old let me archaeologist boom done i gotta stand up for your choices here though Rob, because <laughs> I've, got, I've got confession here is that my inspiration for being an archaeologist was being an eight-year-old and being taken to the streams in and around Fishbourne Roman Palace as a child. And my parents thinking, <laughs> let's just walk around the streams and go looking for bits of pot and see what we find. <laughs> so in the summer, most of my weekends was either looking at a clamp kiln site just down the road or or pootling <laughs> knee-deep around streams looking for generally just finding bits of flints, but obsessed with the idea that I might be able to find something Roman and archaeological and and therefore did it, it has done exactly what you've done and gone yep this is me so. <laughs> but it, it was really i'm sure if i'd sat down and thought about it for any amount of time i would have gone oh, do you know what being a lawyer <laughs> that seems <laughs> like yeah I could, I could make some serious money there but uh no no uh it was it was it's a combination of a lack of imagination and a sort of pathological fear of not being able to pay the bills so just going for the next job the next job the next job because i've just got to have a wage coming in but yeah i got fed through the university system again no imagination at all so started up at ucl and just stayed there because that's the university and i only went there because my brother was in london <laughs> doing uh, doing his university degree but i didn't know what well, i had no idea that ucl when i applied was quite such a fantastic uh department as, as it was mm. i just went there because that's where my brother was and they let me in, uh, despite a B, a C, and an N for A level. Who knew? Who knew? N's. What's an N? Uh, yeah, I don't know. They're not very good, apparently. <laughs> that was good, good enough. Good enough, good. yeah. <laughs> to be fair, I think I scraped through on the fact I had done a certain amount of field work. I hadn't just chosen the one thing after architecture. That, you know, that you so, uh, undergraduate. Lots of field work going on in the background of this. I spent a lot all my summers digging and by this stage being paid. Um, so I was doing sort of commercial stuff. Um, masters worked for Wessex Archaeology for a, for a year or so. And then and then I started getting involved in the in sort of overseas digs. In fact, my gap year was ridiculous. Hmm. I ended up in Jordan at a time where I don't think I could have found Jordan on the map <laughs> digging a site called Tel Shuna which was described by the director as not so much an archaeological site as an aroma rama <laughs> and it was just the smelliest place to work it was just disgusting <laughs> uh but huge adventures nearly died the minefield related incident and then master's phd by this stage i'm interested in animal bones because of tell Schooner, actually mm -hmm. a guy there called uh, paul croft who was the zoo archaeologist on that site we were walking out one day and he picked up a sheep skull, I think it was, and said, oh, look, it's a sheep skull. And I was like, oh, is that possible? It was a complete skull. But I said, can you tell these things? How is Explain to me how you know this is a sheep. And he did. And he explained that it couldn't possibly be a goat because of the way the horns worked and yada, yada. And again, just like the six-year-old me, oh, that's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do that now. <laughs> so, so, yeah, I felt process through the Institute of Archaeology as a zoo archaeologist, um, interested in site formation processes and sort of the structural biomechanics of bone, uh, which I spent a lot of time doing chemistry, which yeah. for somebody who got an N in chemistry at A-level was unexpected. And uh, PhD involved working at uh, Chakalhuyuk um, in Turkey, which was, again, an amazing experience. PhD starting to come to an end, starting to panic that I had bills to pay. 
um, so I applied for the first job <laughs> that came up, and it was a job at the Natural History Museum um, as, as a research assistant on the Ancient Human Occupation of Britain project, uh, which was about as much fun as it's legally possible to have, um, <laughs> and ended up working all sorts of sites. I mean, I know nothing about paleontology. I have to say, I turned up on my first day for the job, and I had to sign in, and I had to sign in the department, and I realized I couldn't spell paleontology. <laughs> That's how qualified I was for that job. Um, so it was a four-year contract. After four years, it was starting to come to an end. I worked at Haysborough, the Haysborough site that you may have heard of, up in Norfolk, that very early site. Huge, huge fun, and met some amazing people. But obviously, contract was looking like it was coming to an end. So panicked, because I've got bills to pay. So I applied for the first job that I could could find and and it was it was Fishbourne Roman Palace. I had worked just after my undergrad at Fishbourne for six weeks mm. for the princely wage of hundred and fifty pounds a week for a six day week, which I thought was I thought I'd landed. Um, <laughs> but I knew the site and they knew me and I applied and obviously nobody else did. <laughs> so they gave me the job. <laughs> and here I am, sixteen years later, talking to you. Amazing. So there's loads of people out there, Rob. Mm. I don't know where to start with them. I guess um, f for start, you, you mentioned Haysborough there, an incredible site. Could you give us a quick overview of, of what you were doing with there? What, what sort of things you were discovering? Why, if someone listening who may not know the site um, previously should go away and, and look it up? Absolutely. It, it, it was amazing. And the nice thing was that we were on board from pretty much the very start of the site, as it were. The famous site, Haysborough 3, but we were there for Haysborough One. So a guy walking his dog for Haysborough One, uh, essentially, long story short, found a hand axe on the beach. And so the AHOB team, the Ancient Human Occupation of Britain, it was going to be called the EHOB team, the Early Human Occupation of Britain. But somebody Googled it, and apparently that's a, a, a make of incontinence pad. So they had very, very quickly <laughs> changed the name at the last minute. But AHOB went out. We were investigating that find. One day we had a sort of a slow day in the office as it were, a few too many people on site. So we were, decided to walk up the beach to try and find a little bit of gravel that we knew was there in the cliff. It's, it's on a beach, the whole, sorry, the whole thing is on a beach. We were looking for some gravel in the cliff that hadn't been exposed for over a hundred years and we thought it might be locatable. And it was just astonishing that they found the gravel. Oh, my life is so dull. We got excited because we found some gravel. <laughs> um, and we were there with um, Simon Parfit and John Weimer, famous John Weimer, and, and a couple of others. Simon Parfit poked his trowel into the cliff, out fell a hand axe, literally, like that. Um, and I can't remember the stats. So we were, immediately went to the pub. I don't remember anything else for the rest <laughs> of the day. But the rest of the team at five o'clock came back off site and we just sat there half cut with a hand axe on the pub table with us in front of us. It was like, hello. And I don't... And what was, sorry, Rob, when did these hand axe date? To? Oh, I was terrified. Did, did I not mention I know nothing about paleontology? <laughs> I, it was a long time ago. I, oh, somebody's going to write in. I think it might be Cremerian, but I think it was exceptional in that it was uh, this, only the second from that period that had ever been found it was it was a very exceptional find about which i recall nothing <laughs> <laughs> i mean that's a good sign of a pub trip i think <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it sounds very old which is good <laughs> <laughs> it was ever so old <laughs> but then we were trying to relate that find to the earlier find and by a complete fluke putting test bits along the beach trying to do that and literally completely accidentally found hazel three and this is all over sort of 10 or 15 years of excavation, um, turned out to be the earliest human site in Britain. In fact, in Northern Europe or more, I've lost track. It's 800,000 years old, I believe. Mm. So lots and lots of time there. I think the entire artifact hall from the site was something in the order of 50 or 60 for many years of excavation. But it was an incredible place to work. And then, of course, and it was after I'd left, but then, of course, they found the footprints. So, you know, 800,000-year-old mm. footprints in the sediments oh. on a beach just off Norfolk. It was just in insanity. And the privilege of working there is it was, was off the scale. It really was, even though I can't remember the dates. Those artefacts, those tools and those footprints, it belonged, to, and it's worth pointing out, to an early human ancestor, didn't they? This isn't Homo sapiens. This is this is Homo antecessor, is it, that... 
would have been roaming around at that time. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Um, and totally unexpected and found completely by fluke. In fact, Simon Parfit, he was involved in Boxgrove and then mm. this, the Haysborough One, I believe. So Boxgrove was the earliest site. Haysborough One, I think, suddenly knocked that out of the park mm. and became the earliest human site in Britain. And then he was involved in Haysborough Three, which again, mm. knocked that out of the park became the earliest human occupation of Britain. And so now we just call him Piltdown Parfit. <laughs> As well, you should. <laughs> Never on podcast because he might hear. Never recorded. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that is amazing. And also what, a, what an acceleration from looking for some gravel to an amazing hand axe, which I've just seen a picture of. It is amazing. I think I would have gone directly to the pub as well. <laughs> you mentioned you were hunting gravel and, and how interesting your life is. I think to put some context on that, the first introduction to archaeology you had was with some charred grains in a tic-tac pot. So I think you're doing okay. You're doing all right there. <laughs> <laughs> some would say as a promotion, I guess. <laughs> Career progression. <laughs> yeah. But also that element of your story makes me so happy because so many, so many of our guests, when we talk about the first archaeology they're exposed to, it's, oh, I saw this amazing artifact. Oh, I went and saw Utsi the Iceman or, oh, I saw this wonderful Samian Ware pot. But to have something organic, a bit of an eco fact rather than an artifact is quite, I quite like that that's, that was the seed to your career. Oh dear. <laughs> well done. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'll, I'll, st I'll stop now. Also, um, um, I'm also in the uh, the failing in chemistry club and then going on doing things with chemistry and archaeology. So we we, sh we share something that I think I got a U, which I think is ungraded or ungradable. Um, Ooh, uh, A is higher than U, I think. Yeah, yeah. You know your students <laughs> listen to this, right? Oh, God, yeah. yeah but they, they, if they don't know I'm incompetent by now, <laughs> they never will. <laughs> but that's, that's amazing to go from charred seeds to the curator of one of the most fantastic sites in the country and if people haven't been they should go and visit it is is incredible um as this is the first time you guys have met before we get on to any of our other questions i just wanted to kind of find some common ground between the three of us and admittedly at the moment the only thing you really know of lawrence is that he used to loot your site as a child so <laughs> we should we should move on from that ever so slightly um never found anything <laughs> one of the other themes that pops up on the twitter fairies twitter feed is huxley and uh, every now and again, I can hear barking in the background with Lawrence. But Huxley is a, is a dominant part of Fishbourne life and indeed the, the Twitter life, isn't he? He is indeed. I don't know how this works. I can, I can make Huxley appear, but it will require... We want to see Huxley. Huxley's <laughs> lovely. Ooh. Oh, oh Huxley. Huxley. <laughs> oh, you handsome brute. <laughs> he is terrified of sneezes, but he's, he's a massive <laughs> idiot. Are you okay? Did you sneeze? <laughs> Oh, he's a good point. He's a good point. <laughs> Before uh, Derek runs off with the proper questions of the podcast, for listeners that haven't visited Fishbourne Roman Palace, could you give us a quick synopsis of how it was discovered? Because that alone is a really exciting story to what they can expect to find today. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a well-trod story. We always put the date of the discovery at 1960. We always knew, everybody always knew there was Roman stuff going on in Fishbourne before that. We know that in 1805, I think, a house was sold and the particulars of the house specified that it came with its own 13-foot black and white mosaic pavement. We don't know which house that was. So there's somebody in the village has got that and they either don't know or they do know and they're not telling us. <laughs> I mean, I, if you came across it on your adventures, Lawrence, you know, well, now's the time. <laughs> I just kept finding one little white brick and then one little black bit. And I was like, this is rubbish, throw one over. Another white bit, throw that over the left show, and another black bit. Throw that over. <laughs> but, but yeah, it was 1960 when they, they were digging a, a, a trench for a water main. And um, the machine driver went through five walls and two mosaics and then stopped, which was good of him. But that was when the archaeologists were, were sort of called in. And it was Barry Cunliffe, Margaret Rule around eight years of excavation and they uncovered the biggest domestic Roman building north of the Alps, something bigger than Buckingham Palace. It's, it, it is absolutely immense, uh, this thing. Half of it's under the village, but the half on display is still bigger than any Roman villa that you're ever going to visit in this country. It's a remarkable place, yeah. It is amazing. I, I You know, I even to this date, I hadn't realised it's a load of it's still under the village, to be honest, because you get to the site and it's such a well-made visitor centre and experience and many memories as a local school child getting taken there for school trips and dressing up as Romans and looking at the mosaics and applying 
what we were studying in class or applying it to what we were studying in class. And it's just the best place to visit as an adult, as a child, as an ambitious student, as whatever you might be. Even a lazy student. As a lazy student. <laughs> Case in point. Um, <laughs> but um, it's just one of the best places to go and visit and really experience Roman Britain firsthand, I'd argue. Absolutely. It's a great place to work. It's, it's, it's not typical Roman Britain. I mean, this place is off the scale in terms of in terms of sort of grandeur and luxury. And, you know, if you go to a lot of Roman villas, if you like, then, then yeah, you'll see half a dozen mosaics, maybe a dozen. Uh, yeah, probably not, not as many as that. I mean, on display in our north wing, one of our four wings on display, we've got 29. I mean, I'm not showing off. I'm not one for showing off, but yeah, these are the, these are the facts. <laughs> and they are beautiful mosaics as well in terms of the, the designs and the elaborate. Very, very early. The really early ones are of imperial quality. They, they, I mean, they would have been laid, they're so early, they would have been laid before there were any local mosaicists. So the only people who could have laid these would have been commissioned by the emperor. You know, these, these are the top guys and certainly our black and white floors, which aren't as popular because people like the coloured figurative mosaics um, uh, but but the black and white geometric ones which yeah from 8075 are just stunning absolutely stunning I, I'm going to put a shout out for the black and white ones because I think they are yeah. my favourite not least because about two kilometres from here just up the road is a is a manufacturing site where they were manufacturing a uh, Kimridge shale rods, which were used for tesserae, that could well have found their way to Fishbourne. We've had the work done. That's where they came from. A, a PhD from Birkbeck, I think, mm. established that, yeah, they are there. And she seemed to think they were coming across land. Yeah, I'm, which... yeah maybe, maybe. I, I, I suspect there's a fair amount of coasting going on at the time, but um, given that, that we're, you're a harbour and we're a harbour, but... Um, it's amazing to have that link from just over there to Fishbourne and 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 that that resource that um, resource was used in the Iron Age for, for making bangles locally and it's one of those lovely examples of the Romans in a very early phase coming in and using a resource which was already quite well known but retasking it and repurposing it to something very Roman so I love it. Do you um, just out of interest? Sorry, Rob. Um, do you have any hypercourse at the? Um... Palace. I'd need to I'd need to Google it to be honest. I'm, yeah, I'm not okay. sure. I, no, I yeah. seem to remember. Um, uh, I thought I'd seen a an advert. A <laughs> <laughs> I have a checker trade advert. They're wonderful. Aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> how, oh. how on earth did that happen, Rob? How did that come yeah, to be? That's a great question. <laughs> great question. I don't know. I don't know. Twitter Twitter made it happen. I was just. I don't know. It was just a thing, and I wish it would stop. <laughs> so, so did, did you just get a phone call one day saying, "Hello, it's Tony Robinson. I'm advertising Checker Trade. Can I come to your?" Oh yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, that, and that happens from time to time. I mean, obviously not Tony, but yeah, somebody phoned, and I, yeah, that was that was quite a big deal actually. Not mm. in terms of yeah, the the sorry, it's very rude to talk about money. The money that must have been behind that that project is insane. <laughs> the, often we 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 get when we have filming, it's like two people in the camera turn up. If that, mm. maybe one person in the camera. It, this was like a scene from Zulu. It was insane. <laughs> 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 but, but yes and that was just the makeup people yeah. <laughs> yeah. that was just Tony's entourage yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, but, amazing and then that led to one of the and, and this is a very niche genre admittedly but one of the <laughs> the greatest archaeological focused twitter spats <laughs> around hypercosts in the world Mm. Uh, apparently so. I mean, literally, people now refer to our. To a, I mean, I don't know. Do, are people going to know what this is all about? Do we, I think? we should probably give some context <laughs> to people that aren't aware of it. I mean, it's hard to un, uh, pre, uh, think that anyone doesn't know what we're talking about. We let, let's contextualise it. Now. Shall I? Shall I do that? Do you want to do that? Uh, you go for <laughs> it. You go for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. So we posted a picture of Tony Robinson in his checker trade advert, and for some reason, someone took against the fact that. Tony had been allowed to stand in the hypercost and 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 he hadn't been allowed to stand and just it just <laughs> blew up in our faces right from there it's it just madness uh, but uh, yeah that's what this, it is this and, was a, you had your own very own troll <laughs> we were kind of trolling each other I think it was, uh, it was, it was like I'm trying to tarnish Miles' reputation like, <laughs> 
I think I'd, I'd move above trolls here and I'd say that this is as close as the archaeological Twitter world ever gets to something like the Real Housewives of Orange County or <laughs> any of those kind of structured reality shows where you know everyone loves each other really but they, there's this kind of amazing drama constructed across the web which was, which was such a joy to behold it was great it was great I, I, was it hashtag hyper course gate is that yeah is that the, uh, anyone that hasn't seen it should just go on twitter put hashtag hyper course gate in, block out a whole weekend yeah and just yeah. look at everything that came out <laughs> One of my favourite elements of Hypercourse Gate, and this is a confession I'm a bit afraid to make on the airwaves, it was my daughter's fifth birthday, I think last year. And uh, because of Twitter and because of Hypercourse Gate, for no other reason, we decided to just go to Fishbourne and see if we could stand in a Hypercourse. <laughs> And we did. <laughs> you made that little girl's dream come you true. You did, you did. She didn't know it was her dream, but maybe that's the thing that in years to come she'll talk about on a podcast as what started her off in a career in Rivers. One, one, of, one of our trustees told, told me he, he went to uh, he went to braiding. He took it down the Isle of Wight, went to braiding, and and he was buying his ticket for braiding. And as, as they were selling him his ticket, he just said, I understand you do a special ticket for people who want to stand in a hypercost. And the woman behind the desk just looked at him and just went, are you on Twitter? (laughs) 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 Yeah, I don't know what we've done, but yeah. We're going to have to find another Uh, angle, I think. The the, the culmination, the, the climax of that, that whole Twitter hashtag discussion was one of it was one of my favourite afternoons of last year. I think when when to see Miles' his happy little face when he when he finally made it was was wonderful. <laughs> was that Miles? I thought that was Tony Robinson, but that's uh... <laughs> ah, ah, ah. <laughs> it, was hard, it was hard to tell. It? <laughs> I oh, yeah. suppose. I mean, we've we've been very um, the guy's going to be furious. I'm going I know. To we've been so uh, we've had too much fun and we should go into the podcast <laughs> <laughs> i know sorry guy sorry <laughs> um so rob you you may you may have heard a few past episodes but you'll know we've got some set questions that we like to ask participants and the first one of those is there is there anything in that career that you've talked through which which you said is very boring and standard but clearly is not very boring and standard that you're particularly proud of that, that you've you've done in that time yeah, well, yeah, I, I'm not going to lie to you. I knew these questions were coming. I think it's probably Haysborough. I've talked about it too much already. And it was only, if you add them all together, it was only a few months of my career. But working at Haysborough was an absolute privilege. I didn't know what was going on three quarters of the time. But working with such great people and, and being involved in such amazing discoveries, the excitement was incredible. But also the camaraderie was absolutely fantastic. Um, but also Chattel Hoyek, working at Chattel. I would never have put myself at Chattel Hoyek and... Uh, and it was it was it was a couple of years, a couple of seasons I worked there, and there's nowhere like that on earth. It was just the most bananas place to work. I never ever want to have to do it again, but I'm glad I did it. <laughs> hey, both both of those sites, if you were to have like a pantheon of archaeological sites throughout human history, both of those sites are hugely influential in how how we understand the past and what a what an absolute privilege it must have been to have worked on both of them so i, I yeah i can see why you'd be chuffed of that <laughs> neither of them were planned <laughs> oh apologies for t- i took the wind out of your sails for that that question with getting carried away in that initial questioning but that, that's fine that, that we, we, we've covered that quite nicely and so what, what about you can cut all of that earlier stuff all the stuff rest <laughs> <laughs> yeah go just just share it um, so if, if we go from pride then what about envy what, what have you seen that that's got you going oh i wouldn't have mind being involved with that or i wish i'd i'd done that yeah i thought about this too and i think maybe tried to two goes at this answer as well but i've worked with naomi sykes at exeter she's now at exeter in fact, she was my flatmate for a couple of years, and we go back a long, long way. In fact, we have basically have so much dirt on each other that we just have to be nice to each other and big each other's careers up forever. <laughs> it's like me and Derek. <laughs> it's a relationship of mutually assured destruction, basically. Mm-hmm. <laughs> she's done some incredible work at, at Fishbourne, and she's had an amazing career. But we both started out, we were third-year undergraduates, living in the same house. We both went to Fishbourne as our first jobs out of university. And she's had an absolutely stratospheric career, absolutely amazing um, 
right the forefront of archaeological science at the moment. And I'm still at Fishbourne. <laughs> <laughs> so, but I'm really proud about it. That's really patronising, isn't it? But I, I look at Naomi and I just bask in her reflected glory, basically. Naomi's career is is amazing and she's she's probably someone we we ought to get on the podcast in a future episode and we 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 may well when we come back for season what are we now four five when we come back for season five um she's she's definitely on the list so if you're listening Naomi um we'll we'll be in touch you're absolutely right she's had an incredible career and certainly one to be to be envious of but we're sort of getting to the most important question of all now. Um, and as, as you're one of our rare guests who's actually listened to a podcast, you know it's coming. Um, <laughs> as you know, Lawrence and I have a working time machine, which we give a return ticket to all of our guests. Now, we we draw on various aspects of sci-fi law to make sure that this works to our benefit. So you can go geographically any way you want. You don't You won't necessarily interfere with things. And if you need to... Um, inhabit a certain persona you can um so you can in, enjoy yourself and go 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 anywhere you want in history so you're going to be so disappointed with this answer <laughs> I, i'm just going to throw out there rob that I'm, I'm sorry neil i'm going to keep doing this but it can't be worse than going back to watch the birth of your kitten so <laughs> you, you i mean the bar is really low so don't worry oh, stop yeah. it. <laughs> love you neil <laughs> I, no i think you're right actually uh, i uh, mainly work on the assumption that uh, time travel is really not very environmentally friendly it's a complete green angle and I, I you can keep your time shin and the risk of getting philosophical is because i don't really want to know the answers <laughs> I, I don't want to go back there and see what actually happened because it's so much more bloody fun sitting here and wondering about it and having arguments and doing podcasts with you guys talking about what might have happened, what might not have happened, and doing the science and then teaching the students and then doing the excavations. If we knew the answers, well, that's our careers down the toilet, isn't it? So, <laughs> so, so I'm. You don't I'm going to tell anyone. <laughs> 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 I'm going to stay here in my in my little my little house in the, in West Sussex, and I'm going to keep not knowing. Not knowing is what I do best, and and I'm going to keep not knowing, and I'm going to keep asking questions. I don't I don't want to know the answers. Oh, it's it's a very honourable answer. I I, I, w- I should say I just thought it popped into my head, Derek. We probably need an ethics policy for the time machine. But that's <laughs> that's 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 that sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Have you really <laughs> <assessed> it? <laughs> if our insurers are listening, yes, yes, we do. Um, but you're you're a, you're a better man than me, Rob. Because if if anything, I'd take the time machine back to 1903. Did you say or 1905? Find out which house had that <laughs> mosaic, and then go and knock on their door and go, no, just impromptu you visit. Or then then maybe travel forwards in time, buy it at a cheap price, post war maybe, Ooh, and then then it's yours. Nice. <laughs> 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 I, I, yeah, I've got enough uh, enough mosaics in my life. I don't need <laughs> You're spoiled for <laughs> mosaics. Now, <laughs> now, before we before we wrap up the podcast, um, I, I think we, we've we've infused about Fishbourne a fair amount in this podcast, um, but it is it's a, a site worth visiting. Is there anything you've got coming up over the summer that people should be aware of, Rob? Oh, good lord! Uh, probably um, it's the kind of thing I should know, isn't it? Um, well, I know we've got half-term activities coming up mm-hmm. for kids okay. next week uh but i guess this will go this out this will be out on sunday so in time for uh first time Ooh, yeah, they yeah. Are. do visitors yeah, so half-termers get down to fish absolutely yeah. absolutely but we always do one big event in the summer um, and i can't tell you the date when it is it'll be on the website but i think it's the roman army visiting this this year at the ermine street guard and for the first time in absolutely years they bring the cavalry, so we're going to have Roman army, the Ermine Street Guard, with their horses, and if previous years are anything to go by, with their siege weapons, firing melons about the place, cabbages. Oh. It, the risk assessment on that, I will say, is absolutely spectacular. <laughs> There's nothing like <laughs> a good risk assessment. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's always a great weekend, so, so it's one I'm looking forward to. Excellent. So get get yourselves down to Fishbourne. And one one final question before we let you go, Rob. Korean ruins are keen on supporting heritage and keen on taking an active role in in supporting the protection of all of these sites. How do we go about adopting a tesserae? <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> I think you can still do it. You just phone us up. Excellent. You penny. Excellent. You penny. We'll give Cheap Penny a call money. and get a career Thanks. in ruins tesserae and you sponsored. Get googly eyes on it and everything. Oh my goodness. That Everything's great. better with googly eyes on it. Yeah. It is without question the dream. 
I mean, I've got a bag of them that I collected when I was about eight years old. <laughs> and on that heritage crime bombshell. <laughs> oh, thank you for joining us, Rob. This has been a genuine, genuine pleasure. Uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, it's good to see you again. Thanks to all our listeners. Thanks to all of our Patreons who are keeping us going this season. If you want to advertise on our podcast, we'll soon be posting a link on our social feeds for um, advertising. But otherwise, keep in touch, shout out to us on Twitter, say hello, and see you next week. <laughs>